Hi Founder fans, Jason here. Welcome to Founder of the Day Week in Review. Here on Thursday, we are going to be discussing the last seven Founders of the Day as published on both FounderoftheDay.com in article form and right here on Founder of the Day for YouTube in video YouTube form. Thank you for coming. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of fun people to go through this afternoon. We'll just kind of plow through. If you have any questions, of course, you are always free to ask. So, First founder is not a founder, and every time I start a video, you hear that little ding, because I forget that YouTube is reminding me that I'm on YouTube, so I apologize for that. Need to figure out how to get rid of that. Anyone popping in? We're just getting started. Constitution Day. So the first founder is a little bit of a cop-out. Last uh, Thursday, I'm sorry, last Friday, every Friday we discuss an anti-federalist. Last Friday was Constitution Day. So I took a little bit of a break, sometimes I do, to discuss uh, the anti-federalists. Because we should celebrate the Anti-Federalists on Constitution Day also. Now, that's only half true. Uh, they did not love the Constitution as it was originally presented. Most of them were not at the Constitutional Convention. But it was many of their arguments that led to the Bill of Rights directly. And the Bill of Rights, while they end up being real important to America, most people today when they reference the Constitution probably reference one of the first Ten Amendments, not the Constitution itself. Uh, and in at large, their participation was equally as important in creating what we really consider the, the Constitution from the American founding, um, in hindsight. I know the, Const uh, the Bill of Rights came, what, four years later, technically, but primarily authored by James Madison, who had a role in the Constitution. Uh, you know, the founders really gave us these amendments, so we should definitely keep that in mind when we're talking about the Constitution and the American Revolution. We get, I like to give a big thumbs up to those anti-federalists. So, uh, I should also note that tomorrow is uh, Federal Farmer 13 we are putting out, which means we are all done with Federal Farmer, and it is time to start discussing who we're going to be discussing next. So, uh, if you have any recommendations of what series of anti-federalist papers from one particular author you'd like me to go through, please let me know. That is pretty much that, though. Let's bounce over here to person number the second, Jonathan Trumbull. I'm going to take a quick sip of my coffee because I'm a little tired today. I'm drinking coffee at night, which I have not done in a very long time. But I need that pick me up for Johnny Trumps, because Jonathan Trumbull is a really important New England founder. Never finds a lot of success at the national stage, but that's okay. By the time the American Revolution breaks out, Jonathan Trumbull is already a leader of Connecticut. He was already fairly old. He was older than most of the other founders. And he had been elected to the governorship of Connecticut. This is very important because... Most governors were royal governors who were appointed by the king or had been governors selected by the corporation that ran a colony. Connecticut had its own thing going and they elected their own governor. So once the revolution breaks out a few years later, Jonathan Trumbull is more attached to the citizens of Connecticut than he is to parliament. I wouldn't say the king. Uh, no one was really... Everyone was attached to the king to some degree, but Jonathan Trumbull, having been one of the few royal gov colonial governors to get elected, had more in common with his constituents than the royal governors. So, uh, revolution starts getting a little revolutionary, and there is, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into Trumbull's whole life, but there is one instance that I'd really like to cover. Uh, Trumbull is hanging out, everything's going fine, and then... The British come looking for powder outside Lexington in Concord, Massachusetts. So, they're looking for powder, and Lexington and Concord happens to be a battle that's super famous. I'm sure you know about it. But, after Lexington and Concord happens, and the British are sent back into Boston, well, Royal Governor, or, uh, I, I guess, Territorial Dictator of Massachusetts, uh, Tom, uh, Gage, ends up contacting his fellow governor in Jonathan Trumbull and saying, Johnny Trumbull, I need more men to help defend Boston from the Patriots. Now, Trumbull gets this letter and doesn't really know what to do with it. Do I just send men? No one in Connecticut wants me to just send men to fight both Massachusetts men and Connecticut men, because there were people from Connecticut who responded to the Lexington alarm and went. So, no, I don't know if I'm going to suppress those people, but he didn't know what to do. So, he sent the letter to the Connecticut Assembly. And Connecticut 
they had a meeting of the government because it was the only government that had not been dissolved yet because Jonathan Trumbull was the only governor who didn't dissolve the assembly once things got a little heated. So he sends the letter over to his government. The Connecticut uh, representatives meet and they come to a decision and they say, Johnny Trumbull, uh, we want you to write back to Gage and we want you to ask him a few questions. Why are they uh, taking the gunpowder in the first place? Uh, what is Gage doing to bring peace and prosperity to our colonies? And what uh, uh, what will you be doing if we send you soldiers? Oh, and also, why are you fortifying Boston? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, if you were fortifying it from ships coming in, maybe you can get by with that, but you're fortifying it from being taken by land. Why are you doing that? So Jonathan Trumbull does this. He does what his government and constituents recommended. He wrote to Gage and said, hey, what's up with this? Uh, and he did not love the response he received from Gage. And this is April 28th, 1775. This is uh, nine days after Lexington and Concord that he writes back asking these questions. And I have a quote here I'd like to read very briefly. Uh, he writes, quote, speaking about the people of Connecticut, Quote, they are most firmly resolved to defend their rights and privileges to the last extremity. They are going to fight to the death to defend their rights. So why are we suppressing them? You know, why are we taking these rights? What's, go what's going on here? Now, again, I I'm not going to get too deep into it. This choice is very important because after the response he gets, Trumbull sides with the Patriots. He is the only governor of a colony to continue as governor after the Revolutionary War begins and continue as governor after the Revolutionary War ends. The entire time. Uh, now, he does pass away in 1785. He doesn't see the new constitution created. But he's a really important member of the, of the revolutionary generation, and especially in New England. For George Washington, once the war gets going and Washington's in charge, uh, Jonathan Trumbull is one of his main contacts in New England. The, once the British evacuate New England, there's not a lot of fighting going on there, but they need men to be recruited. They need the support of New England and the Continental Congress and for the Continental Army. So to do that, they are very fortunate that they receive the support of Trumbull, who is really good at recruiting. He's always, he and Washington are corresponding constantly throughout the war. And additionally, Trumbull has a bunch of kids. One of his kids becomes an artist that gives us many of the images. Uh, I don't think this one in particular, but many of the images of the American revolutionaries we have today, we get from John, one of Jonathan Trumbull's sons. Uh, John Trumbull, another one of his kids, acts as an aide de camp to Washington for a while and then a commissary in the war. So uh, his whole family ends up participating in the revolution and becoming a really important family to be around for much of that time period, as you might imagine. Uh, and that's essentially it for Jonathan Trumbull. You know, this is another character that we could talk a lot about. A lot, a lot, a lot. But uh, I, I, I really like to focus on his choice here that he's received. As I call the article, Jonathan Trumbull's choice. His choice was, do you stick with the king and be a good governor like all the rest of the governors? Or do you be a terrible subject and side with these rabble patriots and fight for independence? And Jonathan Trumbull made the decision that at the time was probably the one that would have hurt his prospects the most. Uh, though again, he was very old at this. He was, he was closer to Franklin's age than most of the American founders. So it's really interesting he decides to make that decision. And unless there are any questions, we will bounce over to Richard Bailey. Now, Richard Bailey's kind of a rando that, uh, whose name you probably don't know, but he's involved with something very interesting in the in the tagline here, uh, the New York City hospital riots. So we'll get there. I'm going to give you some backstory on Bailey before we get to the riots. So Richard Bailey was a young man from New York, and he went to England to study medicine because he was fairly wealthy. And if you had the opportunity, you went to you went to Europe to get your education. He did, and he comes back in 1777 after the war is broken out. He's a young man with the new PhD or, or medical doctorate or whatever they called it back then. He's ready to become a physician. Fortunately, New York City is filled with Tories. So he is in a situation where, okay, I either have to go somewhere in this war-torn nation and set up a practice, or I can just join the British Army as a surgeon. Now, all of his family was in New York City at the time, so and I'm justifying this for him. Uh, Richard Bailey does decide to join the 
British Army. Uh, he does it as a surgeon. Uh, I don't believe he, he does uh, go with his men for a bit, or he is one of the men who joins an expedition. But uh, first of all, he's not really fighting. He's healing. And second of all, he gets sick pretty early and uses that as a reason to back out, which is probably good because he, after he heals, he's able to set up a little practice in New York City. Years go by and the Revolutionary War ends, the British evacuate New York, and Washington and the Continental Army come back in. Now, throughout North America, Loyalists were not treated particularly well. New York City, I will remind you, not only had been occupied since 76 to 83, so that's, what, seven years of constant occupation? And by the way, in 76, part of the city burned down. So New York City couldn't be quite so mean to the leftover loyalists as other colonies and now states were. Uh, they needed people to live in the cities. Uh, so one of these people is Richard Bailey, and his practice does pretty well. And the founders seem to get along swimmingly with him, the other founders. He becomes one of the top doctors in New York. Uh, he is really one of the most respected physicians in all of the young United States when it comes to amputations, cataract surgery, and healing yellow fever. And in addition to this, he does a lot of work helping the poor and doing charitable work, uh, giving his medical advice for free when he should really be charging for it. Uh, and he makes a lot of money teaching anatomy at the at Columbia University, which was then, of course, called King's College. Now, this is where the doctors' riots come in. You see, I by 1788, just as the this while ratification of the Constitution is going on, while the discussion is being had in New York City, do we or do we not join the Union under the Constitution? Uh, one of Richard Bailey's young men, a man named John Hicks, was one of the students studying under Bailey. Now, this story is morbid and hilarious, and the truth is vague. So, there's two sides to this story, as usual. I'm going to tell you, I guess I'll tell you the bad side. So, there are two little kids... No, I'm going to tell you John Hicks' side. Okay, so the student John Hicks, he sees some kids playing outside. He's dissecting an arm, and he thinks it'll be funny to pick up this unattached limb and wave to the children. Hi, look, I've got an arm here. You know, hey, kids, ooh, and he scares the kids. Now, was that a nice thing to do? Probably not. Was it funny? Objectively, yes. <laughs> Is it, uh, were the kids horrified? Yes. Now, here's the other side of the story. The kids run home and tell their father, hey, this guy was waving an arm at us, and he said it was our mom who had just died. It was her arm. Now, did John Hicks say that? We'll never know. But the idea that he was waving an arm saying, look, I got your dead mom's arm. I dug up your mom and I cut her arm off. I don't think he said that because physicians at the time did pay body snatchers to go steal some bodies so they could dissect them and learn about anatomy. That's how they learned at the time. Unfortunately, it was kind of a shady practice being a doctor. But they didn't want to get in trouble for having these bodies. So to flaunt the fact that he would have had a particular body that was dug up, does not seem like it's what would have happened. But that is the story as it goes. Uh, the, that's what the angry mob said when they came to Richard Bailey's office. Hey, do you dig up my dead wife's arm? Yeah, do you dig up his wife's arm? Yeah, that's where I think. And a riot breaks out. Again, while New York is a swing state deciding whether or not to accept the Constitution, a giant group of people in New York City start rioting in front of a doctor's office for digging up dead bodies. So much so that Governor George Clinton of New York has to call out the militia to suppress the rebellion. 
Now, what's interesting, and this is only just striking me, I didn't write this in the article, and it's only just striking me that one of the arguments for the Constitution was the federal government could suppress rebellions of this nature. Now, I haven't looked into this at all, but I think I'm going to. I wonder what kind of effect it had on the minds of the people deciding for the Constitution. I wonder if there were any anti-federalists who were like, oh, wow, maybe we do need to suppress these people. Uh, I'm sure there were a few heads that were turned. It would not surprise me at all. Uh, what did also happen, actually, is New York State started passing new laws because they realized, like, our physicians need to study. And if we want to compete with England and, and Europe and the physicians over there, if we want to have real colleges here, well, we're going to have to give them some opportunity to dissect human bodies. It is just still to this day a part of the way doctors train in medicine. So what the decision was at the time was anyone convinced convicted of a capital crime anyone given a serious anyone given a death sentence their bodies would then be given to physicians for dissection now personally it seems to me this wouldn't be enough bodies for a whole school but at least they're doing something about it um truthfully where else you're gonna get a body <laughs> i mean uh, no one wants them getting dug up either way Richard Bailey, at this point, has had a pretty dramatic effect on New York City when it comes to studying medicine. He would actually go on to be named the first health officer of the Port of New York. See, they had already known about diseases, inoculations were already becoming fairly popular, but sickness would come off the boats. Uh, all these boats would come over, <clears throat> excuse me, from around the world. <laughs> excuse me, excuse me, how did potato chip? I guess I didn't swallow that potato chip all the way before I turned on the camera. I apologize. So, uh, he becomes the first health officer. There were boats coming into New York Harbor all the time, and some of them had sick people on them. And sickness was very, very dangerous back then. So, uh, as first health officer of the Port of New York, he was actually able to quarantine anyone coming off a boat I think it had 40 people or more. Yes, any boat carrying 40 people or more, he had total authorization to quarantine uh, as long as he saw fit. Uh, now, this might seem extreme, but it actually drastically reduced the spread of disease in New York City for several decades, uh, especially his prede not predecessors. He was the predecessor. Everyone he was predecessor to followed his precedent, and uh, it, it really helped for several decades reduce the spread of disease in New York City uh, at a time where they knew very little about disease. Uh, and that's the story of Richard Bailey. Again, he was kind of a loyalist, but he ends up being a really important founder to a young New York City coming out of, you know, being rebuilt from occupation and being burnt down. So, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, unless there's any questions, we'll move over to founder number four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, we'll save, save the Dave Chappelle reference to the next one. Um, Nicholas Lowe. Nicholas Lowe. Okay, so to really talk about Nicholas Lowe as... Unhappy as it is, we need to start with his brother. Nicholas Lowe had a brother, Isaac, and Isaac Lowe is one of the most important early revolutionaries in New York City. Uh, I guess we did two New York City founders in a row. I apologize for that. I try and spice it up, didn't consider it. Anyway, uh, Isaac Lowe, they, uh, Nicholas and Isaac are both merchants. They came from a wealthy merchant family, grew up in one of the fanciest mansions in New Jersey, just outside New York City. Really wealthy guys, really important to the city as the revolutionaries. Now, Nicholas's brother Isaac ends up becoming a real leader. In fact, once the uh, royal governor dissolves New York State's uh, New York Colonial Assembly, uh, I, like most of the other colonies, New York formed a shadow government. They said, okay, if the royal governor is not going to let us meet, we've been elected by the people, we'll just meet anyway in a different building. Uh, most of them they had all different names. New York called them committees. The first was a committee of 51. Later it would be a committee of 60 and committee of 100. That first committee of 51, Nicholas's brother Isaac Lowe was elected chairman of. And he was essentially running the shadow government in revolutionary New York uh, in, between 70, in early 1774 into 1775. And Isaac ends up getting sent to the first Continental Congress. And then... They talk about independence, and Nick's brother Isaac says, no way. 
And despite having been such an important leader before the revolution begins, going to the First Continental Congress, Isaac Lowe ends up becoming a loyalist and after the war would flee North America. Now, Nicholas didn't fancy himself such a politician. Nicholas let his brother do all the talking and then let his brother flee. And Nicholas decides to just hang back and be cool about it and see how things play out. And much like Richard Bailey, who we just discussed, Nicholas Lowe keeps quiet enough that the British don't mind he's there being a merchant. And then when the Patriots come back, they need some people to live and work in New York City. So they kind of overlook Nicholas Lowe's family ties. But it does cast a little bit of a little shadow of doubt on Nicholas's uh, character. And people are nervous about him. Now, <clears throat> uh, let's see. Okay, so despite this, Nicholas Lowe is a wealthy, important person in New York. And five years later, once the Constitution comes around... Nicholas actually goes and is elected to the New York State Ratification Convention, where he votes for the new constitution and approves it. And New York State was one of the last big states to vote, and its vote was close. His vote really mattered, because if he didn't vote and like four or five other people voted differently, New York doesn't join the Union, and our entire history is different. So he actually becomes pretty significant in that moment. Now, uh, he ends up uh, going back home, he just wants to grow his business, but he has a friend, a friend Rufus King. We discussed Rufus King not too long ago. Sorry about that motorcycle. Uh, we discussed Rufus King not terribly long ago. Really, really important founder. Ends up being the last Federalist or the final Federalist is what I generally call him. Uh, Rufus King ends up getting elected to be New York's first, one of two of New York's first senators in the United States Senate. And Nicholas, uh, does his book for him while he's busy. And even more than that, uh, Rufus King ends up being chosen as Minister to Great Britain by President Washington. And he goes overseas for several years. And while he's overseas, Nicholas Lowe is keeping his friend's books. It's really important. You don't want to go broke when you're serving overseas as an ambassador and to watch someone's finances. You know, we don't talk about modern politics because things are different now. They're the same, but horribly different. But <laughs> the same. But back then, you were a th two-month boat ride from home. So Rufus King could not have been minister to Great Britain without Nicholas Lowe's help. And additionally, King does a good enough job where once Thomas Jefferson takes over for John Adams as president, he keeps Rufus King in the position. So King's a really important character, and Nicholas Lowe playing kind of a backup role to his story is in itself very important. Uh, individually, uh, Nicholas actually gets elected to the New York State Assembly for two years. It's kind of a minor role. He's just hanging out there, but I want to note that. Now, later on in life, once King starts coming back, Nicholas Lowe starts investing in land. Now, after the revolution, it was the best way for a very wealthy person to lose all their money was to speculate in land. Nicholas Lowe did just this, except he doesn't lose all his money, as opposed to most of the other people who bought giant swaths of land that just suddenly became available after this revolution. Uh, those people, for the most part, you know, and these are famous people, your, your William Bingham's and your, your um, Robert Morris's and, and your Wadsworth's, not all of those people went broke, but some of them went very broke, but they would buy a whole giant swath of land and they'd try and sell it in parcels and then say, okay, you go ahead and move to that land I just sold you and start a town, I guess. Nicholas Lowe would go to these places, oversee the creation of a village that had mills and churches and other things you might expect in a small village of the time, and then he would sell the surrounding plots. And people were more eager to buy these because there was already a little town established. They didn't have to literally cut down all the trees so there's a little area, a clearing, and then build a church, which would also act as a tavern and a town hall, and then cut down more trees and build a house. All you had to do was show up on your land and clear your land and build your house. Uh, and it's a significant move, which I'm surprised that more people didn't catch on too quick. He does this for Watertown, which Watertown's up on the Canadian border. Now, I'm from, I live in upstate New York, so I know a little bit probably more about some of these towns than you might otherwise expect. Uh, Watertown's a little bit of a city. Uh, right on the Canadian border, it's by Fort Bragg. No, 
Ford's drum. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law is in Fort Bragg, so sorry about that. Uh, it's by Ford Drum, which does a lot of like snow training because it's real cold up there. Uh, also, there's a Frank Sinatra album called Watertown, which is a best story based on a person who lives there. It's arguably one of the first concept albums. Total side note. Uh, he also started Lowellville, which is kind of his namesake. It's a very small town. And then Boston Spa, which is not terribly far from Saratoga uh, or Albany, New York. And it's a, it's a nice little village. I drive through the visiting family on my way to Lake George every once in a while. So, fun fact about me. Uh, and he actually ends up moving to Boston Spa and spending uh, many of his later years there. I, he might even be buried there. That I don't know. I think he might be buried there. Um, <clears throat> and that's uh, Nicholas Lowe, who spent a lot of years clearing his family name after his brother was so close to being a leading patriot and then went ahead and became a loyalist. <clears throat> Excuse me. Take another quick sip. I am not quick enough at muting my uh, stuff over here. Joseph Hughes, founder of 1234 Fiel. Joseph Hughes. This gentleman signs the Declaration of Independence. So let's talk about him. Hughes was originally born in New Jersey, but he ends up moving to uh, North Carolina as a very young man. And he's kind of a self-made man. He ends up starting a merchant business, eventually buys one, two, a handful of ships. By the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, he actually is sent to the First Continental Congress. He has become a leader in North Carolina. Uh, and he's just... Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he had moved... At 30, he moved to North Carolina. So I apologize. Uh, he's a little bit older than that. Uh, I believe he's in his... 40s or so don't quote me on that uh once things get a little hostile now he becomes a leader and he's already been elected to the uh, colonial assembly once tensions are rising so hughes is chosen to represent north carolina at the first continental congress he goes to philadelphia first continental congress he supports and signs the uh, declaration of rights and the uh, Continental Association, which institutes a boycott. Now, this is going to really adversely affect him. He's a merchant. He's got a bunch of ships importing from Britain primarily. This is not going to be good for him because his ships kind of have to sit to the sides. Now, Hughes, despite this, ends up going back to the Second Continental Congress, and it's in November of 1775, about six months after the war actually begins. Uh, I'm sorry, October of 1775, about six months after the war actually begins, that Continental Congress creates the Marine Committee. Hughes is put on the Marine Committee and actually made chairman of the Marine Committee. And the Marine Committee's primary job is to build a Navy. Well, how do you do, how do, you do that? How do you build a Navy from scratch? Well, when you're Joseph Hughes, you take these ships that have been sitting around for a year and a half that you haven't been able to use because you helped start a boycott against your ships. And you volunteer them to outfit for the Navy. And he does this. And several of the first ships outfitted for the use in the Continental Navy, America's first Navy, are ships owned by Joseph Hughes. Now, there is a little bit of a fun argument that takes place right at the beginning here. And when you start a Navy, other than building the ships, you need to put someone in charge. Not just someone in charge of the Marine Committee. You need a Commodore to take over and run your show. And there's where the rub lies in. That's where we meet the rub in the road. Anyway, Joseph Hughes gets into a bit of a heated argument with John Adams, who's also on the Marine Committee. Now, Adams and Hughes had a great relationship both before and after this discussion, so don't let this conversation uh, convince you otherwise. However, they both had a very particular opinion of who should be Commodore of the new Continental Navy. See, uh, John Adams had a northerner in mind. And Joseph Hughes said, no, 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 no. We put George Washington in charge because we need the support of the South. At this point, 1775, they were still sieging Boston. It was still mostly New Englanders. And Joseph Hughes said, no, nah, we need a guy from the South to really uh, help bring everyone together. And John Adams said, no, nah, I got the guy from the North. John Adams recommended Essex Hopkins. Now, Essex Hopkins would get the job. John Adams would win this conversation. Uh, Essex Hopkins is the brother of Stephen Hopkins, another signer of the Declaration of Independence, uh, along with John Adams and, spoiler alert, Joseph Hughes. But uh, Hopkins, uh, he takes the job. He does pretty good at the beginning, but he 
Continental Congress had a lot of political infighting, so even though Hopkins does good right off the bat, he ends up kind of sitting around in, I believe, Rhode Island or, or maybe Connecticut for uh, for like a year after doing some good stuff in the uh, uh, Caribbean. Unfortunately for him, uh, he gets a lot of uh, trash talk and talk to him that he really doesn't deserve in hindsight, but it looks like a really bad decision on John Adams' part. Now, as for Joseph Hughes, he was arguing for another person from the South, as I mentioned, and I'm going to tell you who it is, but I saved it for a reason, because the person he wanted to put in charge was John Paul Jones. And I don't care what you know about the Continental Navy. I don't know if you know anything about it. You certainly recognize the name John Paul Jones. Every American recognizes the name, even if they don't know why. Well, John Paul Jones goes over to England and Great Britain and sails around the island just taking out British ships willy-nilly like. Uh, there's a lot more to the story than that. He does spend like a year trying to get a ship and there's a lot going on. But John Paul Jones becomes an American naval hero and are often called the father of the American Navy, despite the fact that he was not given that top position. I should also side note here, though, is that he wasn't actually from the South. He was actually from uh, somewhere in uh, Great Britain. Uh, it might have been Irish. I don't remember exactly, but his story's a little shady at the beginning, John Paul Jones. He, like, leaves... He's, I don't know if he's a captain of a ship, but he's, he's, he's running a ship. He's a, he's a high rank on a ship. He ends up um, uh, killing a guy. It seems like he was disciplining him and disciplined him to death, uh, which was a little uncommon. Uh, violent discipline was common on ships. Killing your men was not very common. Uh, so John Paul, as his birth name goes, comes to the United States, uh, gets mixed up with the Jones family of South Carolina, a uh, uh, Wiley Jones, I think is the guy's name, and he's he's so grateful that these people were nice to him that he actually, he needs to get a fake name so that the British can't find him, so he, he adds Jones onto the end of his name, so his name was actually John Paul, comes John Paul Jones, like I said, Hughes didn't know him very well, but really liked what he had to say as far as captaining a ship and, uh, not commandeering, um, uh, uh, commodoring an army goes, uh, and he tried to get John Paul Jones to take over now. I'll be honest, there are several other characters in the Continental Navy who also get way overlooked. The war at sea gets overlooked very much at large. Uh, that and the Western Theater are the two theaters that you just don't hear people talk enough about, especially the Western Theater. At least people know the name John Paul Jones. Uh, uh, not, not a lot of people know, know George Rogers Clark quite as well. Either way, cat's about to open the door. Sorry about that. Uh, Joseph Hughes loses that discussion. It doesn't look out for Essex Hopkins, who I have a huge debt of sympathy for, because Hopkins, like, ran through the British lines to get out with their initial Continental... Like, the first Continental Navy was trapped, and he runs them and gets out, and then he goes and wins a bunch of battles in South Carolina, uh, uh, in the Caribbean, and takes a bunch of ships, and then he loses a battle going into harbor, and then no one gives him instructions, and he doesn't... You know, much like George Washington didn't want to do anything that Congress didn't approve, that's how Hopkins felt, and they don't approve. So that they don't approve him to do anything, and then they say, why aren't you doing anything? And then they're like, oh, hey, we told you you could do whatever you thought was right, but also, why'd you go to the Caribbean? We don't think that's right. And it's like, he won a bunch of battles down there. Okay, okay. <laughs> I'm going with Hopkins. I'm too angry. Yes, Troy, John Paul Jones is a lot of fun. Absolutely agree. Anyone who lives under an assumed name for any period of time, <laughs> I have to acknowledge, was probably a lot of fun. As for Hughes, he hangs around for another year, and the Declaration of Independence comes around. Hughes is actually very timid when it comes to declaring independence. He is like many people at the time and thinks, okay, we could probably resolve this. Uh, you can't. <laughs> and uh, he is convinced just beforehand, okay, declaring independence is the only way out from here. So he does vote for independence and later signs the Declaration of Independence with the aforementioned John Adams and uh, uh, Stephen Hopkins, who has the famous line, my hand trembles but my heart does not, because he had palsy and his hand shook when he signed his name on the Declaration of Independence, and it's Stephen Hopkins' brother, Essex Hopkins, is the one who everyone's yelling at as Commodore of the Navy. Also, uh, Essex is a cool name. That's irrelevant. I just feel that way. 
Now, Joseph Yu's story isn't so super duper at the end. Um, oh, I did skip one thing. Okay, if we can just cut back a little bit to before independence was declared. Uh, North Carolina created the Halifax Resolves, which was a set of resolves they sent to the Continental Congress that basically said, hey, we think we should declare independence. Uh, Joseph Hughes, as the leader of the North Carolina delegation, is the one who presented those to the Continental Congress, which that, uh, having come out, it's in the spring of 76, so just after Thomas Paine publishes Common Sense, and just about the same time Virginia sent their, send in their own set of resolves. Uh, it's one of the things that gets the ball rolling towards independence, despite at the time not supporting it. Hughes does his duty. Uh, reiterating what I like to say here is that these people really wanted to follow their instructions from their state. They did not see themselves as lawmakers at all. They were simply ambassadors representing their individual colonies at this point till independence is declared. So, unfortunately for Hughes, after independence, he is then placed on the committee to draft the Articles of Confederation. Now, John Dickinson gets like 98.7% of the credit for drafting the original draft of the Articles of Confederation, but we do want to acknowledge the rest of the committee. Joseph Hughes is one of those people who helped create the first government of the United States. It wasn't a government of the United States. It was a firm league of friendship where the states retained their sovereignty, but he was helped to create it. Unfortunately, in 1779, he falls ill and he dies real suddenly in Philadelphia. He's a North Carolina guy, but he's still there doing his duty until the very last second. He ends up passing away. Uh, all of the Continental Congress attend his funeral and they unanimously agree to officially have the United Colonies, at this point, United States, mourn his passing for one month. He's one of the few people who actually gets that respectable honor from his colleagues. And again, he's been there since day, this is 1779. He went in 1774. This is four years of the, the most hardcore starting a revolution and getting it done. Uh, Joseph uses a fascinating character. He plays one of those minor roles, a major role in the eyes of his contemporaries, a minor footnote in the eyes of history, unfortunately. So, Hopefully we changed that a little bit today. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you guys for coming. If you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. I'll take another quick sip of this. Because all this chat shit. And Troy, I'm going to throw out to you too. Um, tomorrow is the last... Uh, tomorrow is Federal Farmer 13. It's the last Federal Farmer. So we need to choose another Anti-Federalist to go through their papers. Uh, so be on the lookout. Sometime in the next day or two, I'm going to put out a... um a poll. I'll probably put one out for Patreon. Uh, I might put another one who, uh, out for like Twitter or something. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, oh, I actually might be able to do them on YouTube too. Uh, man, I should know these things. Uh, but, uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to pick a few that are interesting and, and put those out there. We'll see who we do next. Uh, so that's fun. We have that to look forward to. We also have another founder to look forward to. Six, John Hoskins Stone. So this story is pretty intense. Uh, John Hoskins Stone is from Maryland. Uh, as soon as Lexington... Okay. A vote off... Okay, well, fair enough. <laughs> well played. You got me. I don't know how to limit votes, so whatever. Uh, by the time the Revolutionary War breaks out, John Hoskins Stone's older brother, Thomas Stone, is already in the Continental Congress. He comes from a pretty wealthy family. In fact, his brother Thomas would sign the Declaration of Independence, making his brother Thomas more famous. <laughs> John joins the fight right away. As soon as Lexington and Concord is heard, before his brother signs the Declaration of Independence, as soon as Lexington and Concord breaks out, he joins the Maryland militia. Uh, Maryland, very wealthy uh, militia, the battalion, I'm sorry, not militia, Continental Army. He joins under William Smallwood, and Smallwood starts out as a uh, colonel, and underneath him, Stone is a lieutenant. Now, for most of the career, William Smallwood would end up making it to Major General. Uh, Stone would not make it to Brigadier General, despite the fact that along the way, they would both get promotions simultaneously. Hi, Nick, thanks for coming. They would both get promotions simultaneously because they worked really well together. Uh, over the years, he serves in several battles. They go north. 
uh, backs out, they go all over the place. Um, and then they go to Germantown. And at Germantown, Hoskins Stone gets a ball on the ankle. And he goes down, and he is brought to the doctors, and they say, listen, you're probably never going to walk properly again. It's going to take a good amount of time to heal. You know, there's not a lot of promises we can give you. You know, he got shot in the, in the ankle, so that's tough. Hoskins Stone, John Hoskins Stone thinks, you know what? It's not fair of me to continue being an officer when I can't actually serve. Meanwhile, there are other officers below me who would love to take my rank and paycheck. And he resigns. He sends a letter of resignation to George Washington, uh, to which George Washington responds, No, man. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. In fact, I have a quote. Uh, he said, Washington says, quote, he would, quote, regret that the service has lost such a good officer. However, he asked Stone to stay on for, quote, for at least a month or six weeks longer. So literally says, give me four to six more weeks. If, if you're still so hurt after four to six weeks, you can resign. But time goes by and his leg feels better. So he takes back his resignation, his first resignation. And Hoskins Stone sticks around. Following year, he's back in action, and he's serving at Stony Point. This time, he's wounded again. This time, it's a lot more serious. He is shot in the arm and the head. Now, he survives this, uh, and actually, it's a lot, largely thanks to James Fernandez. It's interesting. I come across the, the name James Fernandez when, I'm, when I was studying Stone, but... There's not a lot of information out there about him. In fact, the only place you really find the name James Fernandez is when you're reading about Stone getting shot in the head. So, James Fernandez was also shot, and he picks up Stone, his commander, and puts him on his shoulders and runs him from the field, despite, again, being wounded himself. And when he does this, the doctors are then able to get to him, because the surgeons weren't running on the field, and they're able to stop the bleeding and save Stone's life. Now... Once again, Stone tries to resign from the Continental Army. This time, George Washington says, you know, as opposed to the first time where he said, oh, you got shot in the ankle, man up. This time he's like, oh, you got shot in the head. You may leave. <laughs> uh, you weren't going to tough out a bullet to the head. Uh, now, fortunately for, for John Hoskins Stone, he miraculously makes full recovery. In fact, by the time... Is still only 29 years old. He is then appointed to Maryland's Executive Council. <coughs> Excuse me. Hate a chip in there. It just won't go away. Uh, John Hoskinson is elected to Maryland's uh, uh, Executive Council. And the Executive Council, we've discussed this before, there, there was many of the states with their first governments had Executive Councils, which was kind of a combination of state senate and governor's cabinet and you were appointed to these positions and again he's twice wounded got shot in the head but he's 29 years old has now resigned from the continental army and he joins the executive council he spends several years there before he's actually elected himself to maryland's house of representatives he spends a decade in maryland's house of representatives and then he's elected governor of maryland in the 1790s so an astounding achievement for, again, someone who had probably the most serious wound you're going to face and survive. Uh, he, he spends, I think, I think he only spends uh, two terms there. Yes, his second term. He has two terms there. Uh, now, from my perspective, the most important thing he does as governor of Maryland is, as Washington, D.C. is being built, uh, Stone leads Maryland in helping to pay for the capital to be built. Now, of course, Maryland was very strategically positioned for where Washington, D.C. currently sits, so you could see their excitement having the federal district be right there for them. Uh, but that seems to be the most important thing. But for his perspective, I have another lengthy quote here. Uh, while he was governor, in George Washington's second term, People stopped being so in love with George Washington. For the first time since before the Revolutionary War started, Washington is really getting publicly criticized for his decisions as commander-in-chief. Stone thinks that's garbage, 
And Maryland, to a large degree, did too. In fact, twice. Stone convinces the Maryland Assembly to declare their approval of the conduct of General Washington. Uh, and they do this. And Stone, as governor, is responsible for sending the letter to Washington saying, hey, we all just officially voted. The law in Maryland says you're doing a great job now. Seems kind of like, I don't like a waste of time, but, uh, you know, it was a young nation. Uh, and I'm going to read you a pretty lengthy excerpt here from Stone's letter to Washington. But I think it's important to see how the people who supported Washington, even at times of crisis, really supported him. It also demonstrates the Maryland he was overseeing. And it demonstrates a lot about his character and what he thought was important too. So, um, quote, I consider as the most agreeable and honorable circumstance of my life that during my administering the government of Maryland, I should have been twice gratified in communicating to you the unanimous and unreserved approbation of my countrymen of your public conduct, as well as their gratitude for your eminent services. As this will probably be the last time which this pleasing duty will devolve on me, I beg permission to add most cordially, most cordially to join my countrymen in those sentiments which are made with such sincerity. With the highest respect and greatest res regard, I have the honor to be, sir, your most obedient servant, John Hoskins Stone. I just really love reading that quote. I don't know what it is about that particular line. I fell into, I'll, I'll be honest, this is one of the articles I wrote a few years ago, and I've, as I've mentioned, some of my older articles, since they're in the past, I've been bringing back, because some guys are fun, and we shouldn't forget them, because I wrote about them three years ago. We should talk about them again. Uh, such loyalty born of bat. There's got to be a spelling there. <laughs> there, Troy. Uh, battle. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and again, he was wounded and thought the right thing to do would be step aside. You don't see that from a lot of officers. Uh, so he just did that. Uh, did he respond to the letter? I don't know of an official, I, I don't know of a response. Uh, generally what Washington would have done is had his secretary say, you know, I acknowledge your acceptance of my behavior and my gratitude is vice versa. You know, so I doubt Washington probably would have read the letter and been like Tobias Lear, <laughs> write them a thank you, right? Like, uh, or whatever secretary is around, write them a thank you for me, you know? Um, because to be fair, Washington gets, Washington got so much correspondence. Like you think scrolling through Twitter is a lot of information. Like Washington would get, I guess I could compare it to like fan mail back in the 60s, 70s, 80s when people wrote letters and didn't call. Like, you know, when TV stars would get bags of fan mail, Washington would just get, all of them would get just every day, just letters and letters and letters and letters. Uh, and Washington would just get so many that uh, it would at least have been read to him if he didn't read it himself, but he probably didn't write the response himself. That's an assumption I'm making based on my experience with George Washington, but I don't know. Uh, I should look that up. I should look that up. Uh, maybe we'll take a peek at the end here if we have some time. Uh, but that's John Hoskins Stone. He ends up retiring after he's governor, as many people do. And the last founder of the day. Now, I'm going to be honest. As I said, I like to... Oh, I just realized I dropped that real hard. Sorry about that. Um, I don't... I've been reusing a good amount of my old art. And, and it sounds like kind of a cop-out. Truthfully, it's so I can focus more on these YouTube videos. Uh, but, uh, you looked up Stone? Oh, Nick, uh, I don't know if you've been to Founders Online. I think it's .gov. Uh, you can see, like, all of their correspondence there. It's super easy. So that's probably what we looked up. But, um, Hemsley is one of these older articles that I wanted to redo. And I don't, I, I like, went through it a bunch of times in the last few days and just don't love the article I published. It's not wrong. It's just, I don't know how to say it. There's something missing. Like usually I'm really good at narrowing it down and giving a brief story. Uh, this one's tough, but we're going to go through it. <coughs> July 17th. Nice. Just after my dad's just before my brothers. Okay. Um, William 
Hemsley was a rich, Mar another two Marylanders in a row. We never get two Marylanders in a row. Two New York City guys isn't that surprising. Okay, whoopsie daisy. So, William Hemsley was this rich guy hanging out in Maryland who, like, didn't join the fight on either side. He was a plantation owner, and he was just happy owning his plantation, hanging around. Until 1779, where he is elected to the state senate. He's there for three years, and then Maryland says, uh, go to the Continental Congress. And he's like, okay. And he goes there after the Articles of Confederation are ratified, where not a lot's going on. And he's one of these younger men, as we keep meeting, who was in the early 1780s in the Continental Congress, realizing that it was a joke job, and there was nothing going on, and they couldn't get anything done, and they had all these debts that they're supposed to pay back, but they can't pay anything back, and there's a lot of problems going on. And it was this crew from the 1780s that would largely uh, lead to the United States Constitution. Your, your James Madison, your Alexander Hamiltons, your Tench Tillmans, uh, uh, not Tench Tillman, I'm sorry, Tench Coxes. There were two people named Tench back in the day. Um, your Rufus Kings. Uh, so, anyway, uh, he's one of these people. He's only there for two years. Okay, uh, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip to the end and talk about his life. Then I'll go back and talk about what the article is really corely about. Uh, he goes back to Maryland after the Continental Congress, serves in the Maryland Assembly sporadically for the next decade, but doesn't play a large role. Um, he does go to Maryland's ratification convention where he votes for the United States Constitution. And then he goes back to his plantation. So uh, a really low-level player guy. Now, the thing is, what was fascinating about his story is coinage. Wake up. <laughs> I know it sounds really boring. Uh, truthfully, some of the numbers were hard to get through, and that's what I don't love about the article, is I feel like I just didn't get through. I didn't get what I was trying to get through, through to the reader. So I apologize if you ran into that issue, but let's talk about it. So the uh, Continental Army, uh, the Continental Congress had a real money problem, a real money problem. After the Articles of Confederation were ratified, there were a few things they could do, and one of the things was to try and hone in the currencies. Each state had its own currency. Uh, they also accepted gold and silver, usually. Uh, the Spanish dollar, which was the really the U.S. dollar of the day, what the United States dollar is to the world right now, the uh, Spanish dollar was to the world. Back then, even though Spain's power was declining, their money was everywhere and pretty steady. Uh, people accepted the British pound. I mean, heck, if someone came with some francs from France, you might accept them. Who knows? Um, they were discussing ways and uh, weights and measures. Hem Hemsley's real important part in this dialogue is not what he did. It's a letter he received. He was friendly with Governor Morris. Governor Morris is a name you might recognize. He was the one-legged ladies' man who wrote We the People on the Constitution. He actually drafted the whole Constitution. Uh, he was also one of the financiers of the Revolution. So here in the early 1780s, he's working with Robert Morris. Robert Morris is the financier of the Revolution. Uh, Governor Morris, unrelated, just happened to have the same last name, uh, ends up working under him. And at this time, Morris writes to Hemsley a very lengthy description about how we can unite all these currencies under one currency, how we can create an American currency. Uh, he goes through very boringly in great detail how what metals you should use and the weights of each metal and regard how much they should be worth, uh, how you know this one weight of metal would be related to the Spanish dollar while at the same time New York's currency and South Carolina's currency. It's really boring. But if you like finances, there is a link in the article to the letter that I put in there. Because it's fascinating. Boring, but fascinating. Uh, and he goes through and, uh, like I said, really outlines essentially what... It's not exactly how things would end up a decade later under the Constitution, but it's a good start. And Governor Morris, as you know, was at the time financing the revolution. Years later, would be important... At the Constitutional Convention, he would end up being, uh, Governor Morris has a huge story. I'm not going to get into his whole story. I probably should do another episode on him because I haven't talked about him for a while. But, and someone left because it's so boring. <laughs> um, but 
interestingly, what's, what's really fascinating about Hemsley is he doesn't love the idea about integrating the current... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. He does like the idea of integrating the currencies into one more solid North American currency. But they also propose at one point to have the Continental Congress pay the war debts for all the other states. Because this is just as the war... This is 1782 into 83. So the hostilities of... Are, are, it's after Yorktown. The major hostilities are over, but it's before the Treaty of Peace comes. So... The war's not really over. Now, they're talking about uh, paying off the war debts from each individual state. This would later happen 10 years later under Alexander Hamilton, who's one of the people at this time in the Continental Congress saying, we should assume everyone's debt. And everyone's like, no, shut up, Alex. <laughs> like, uh, Hamsley's one of these people. He doesn't think they should do that. Now, that's because Maryland, first of all, had no battles on Maryland soil. Maryland's, I, I think, the only colony that had zero fighting on its actual soil. Uh, I think, I don't, yeah, I think Maryland's the only one. So they didn't have any debts. So they didn't like the idea of paying other people's debts. Now, was Hemsley, was this Hemsley's idea? Or, as we said before, they very much followed the instructions from their state. And Maryland would have said, no, don't pay anyone's debt, because Maryland was the last one to ratify the Articles of Confederation because they were having problems with Virginia and Delaware and their neighbors. So it's very hard to determine if Hemley's decision to not support the assumption or the paying of war debts was his actual feelings or him just following instructions. Interestingly, uh, what I was reading is that New Jersey were the leaders in not paying money for previous debts now that the war was over. And the reason for this is New Jersey had most of the battles, but they were also super close to Philadelphia. So they would immediately, after a battle, send someone to Philadelphia and say, hey, we need to be reimbursed for this real quick because we're fighting the war. So they would get theirs paid off immediately, which meant they had already paid all theirs off by the time the war ends and you have like, Georgia and South Carolina only just getting evacuated. Hey, can we have some of that money, please? What money? Uh, so it's interesting that uh, Hemsley doesn't want to pay off those war debts, but does want a currency and does, as I said, go to the ratification convention in Maryland and vote for the Constitution. Uh, I guess he thought it would be more important to get the economy going as a nation than it was to worry about paying off someone else's debt. Because, hey, what happens after that? Well, Allie Ham shows up. <laughs> Starts assuming debts. And then starting the stock exchange and a bunch of banks. Not going to get into that. <laughs> oh, Alex. If, uh, if you've been watching long enough, you've probably gotten my hints that Alexander Hamilton, his politics are not necessarily my favorites though to be fair the people whose politics i do like were awful human beings so thanks thomas jefferson <laughs> um anyway oh well it's telling me i'm having some problems with my stream of course here we are at the end and now we're running into problems at least we made it through. That was William Hemsley. Again, he's a real role player, but I stumbled onto this whole discussion about coinage, and I think I presented it better here than I did in written form, which I apologize for, but you guys are watching and not reading, so I guess forget them. Uh, you guys, keep a lookout. Uh, thanks to the Patriots on Patreon who are helping to support this channel. I am about to put out that poll uh, probably Saturday because uh, I have some family coming in for all my children's birthdays are all at the same time. By all, I mean both. Whatever. Uh, but we got to choose a new uh, Anti-Federalist for next week. And we have just a whole lot more fun stuff. Oh, okay. And next week, I hope this is working because it's telling me you're having problems now. Next week, I think on Saturday might be Sunday. I haven't chosen the day yet, but I need to do my annual 
Founding Fathers Fantasy Draft Rankings, which I've done every year. I'm a little late this year, but it's fantasy sports season, and I do it every year, uh, and it changes this year. And actually, there is one, I was really thinking about it last night, there is going to be one major change. It's basically me going through the list of my top 100 most important Founding Fathers for the revolution, according to me. Uh, so it's totally subjective, but there is a major change in the top 10 that I am very excited to announce. So look forward to that. Uh, if you guys have any questions, excellent, we're, we're excellent connection again. Great. Uh, if you guys have any questions, I'm always here, you know, uh, Twitter, Facebook, I kind of suck at responding on Facebook, but you can try me there. You can email me. Uh, you can leave a comment here. Uh, Discord, I we, we link in the description to join the Discord chat uh, conversation. Whatever way you want to find me, find me. Uh, unless you're the people who have suddenly gotten a hold of my phone number and are texting me uh, about uh, trying to convince me, uh, trying to trying to trick me into giving you my credit card information. <laughs> uh, cool. Yeah, it's super hard. So Nick, if you want to, you or, or Nick and Troy, uh, I've done it. I, you might have been around last year, Troy, at that point when I did it last time. Um, fantasy draft for the win. Yeah. Uh, I've done three of them at this point, so you can go check those out and make, maybe we'll make your predictions. We'll have some kind of pool to guess, like, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. Uh, you can get, maybe, like, guess my top ten. I'll, I, we should think of some kind of pool. Because you can't really draft them. I was really thinking about how you would, like, draft them, and maybe, like, you give them each a number and we roll dice. I was really trying to figure out how to, like, have a draft and then make it work, but... That's tough. So just the draft listings will be fun. Uh, Troy, thank you so much. I will be here 8.30. We're starting to do... Uh, I know you're the one person I was thinking about, Troy, because you usually have to leave a little early, but most people show up later. So I'm going to start doing them at 8.30 for trivia because... And uh, my time. 8.30 Eastern. Because that's better for most people. And I really was like thinking, like, but Troy like goes to dinner every week. I'm <laughs> like... So, I hope I don't screw you up too much. Uh, if it does, maybe we'll do it at 9 in the future. Because I really want to cater to those of you who come every week. <laughs> uh, let me know how that affects you. Uh, you guys are awesome. I am out of here. I'm starting to get hot. I pick, It started slow, picked up, got a lot of fun. Again, thank you to the Patriots on Patreon and anyone who's bought a shirt or anything like that. Uh, the few dollars helps just go pay off the hosting fees for the website. So thank you guys so much. Uh, it is round bottom.